to have these uh, Khalistani elements uh, or other the Sikh diaspora, which is very large in number in, 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 in these countries. And amongst them, you have the people uh, who, have no who have no stake in India in the sense that they're, they're not citizens of India. They have no future in India. They may have interest in India, but they have no future in India. And they are safe and secure in a foreign country. So they are developing an agenda. And this has other useful purposes. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, uh, by, being the, by being extremists and uh, activists and whatever else, they want to control the Gurdwara. Mm -hmm. And Gurdwara, as you know, in the Sikh tradition, <laughs> they receive a lot of money. A lot yeah. of money. Uh, in fact, that is what SGPC politics is. <laughs> they have a lot of money at their command. And this money they can use uh, for financing political parties and for other uh, purposes. And then they have got involved in, uh, in drug trafficking, human trafficking, organized crime, violence, and, and, and everything else. So it's a power play. They want to control uh, the, the Sikh community and be, the, be recognized as the, as the leaders in addition to what they think are the grievances of the Sikh community. And Welcome to the GIST on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Gangadharan. It's been nearly two weeks since uh, Justin Trudeau made those sensational allegations in the Canadian Parliament, uh, claiming that uh, there was an Indian role in the killing of Khalistani extremist Hardeep Tijar. Uh, two weeks down the line, uh, nothing at all from, from him. In fact, it would appear that in some respects, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister has even backtracked. So let's try and figure out what's going on over there. I have with me Ambassador Kamal Sibyl, former Foreign Secretary, former Ambassador to France and Russia. Sir, good evening. Uh, glad to have you. My pleasure. So what do you make of uh, the situation where um, after all that song and dance and uh, fire and ice, uh, nothing further seems to have happened after that? Well, uh, you know, just before uh, uh, Jai Shankar was to meet uh, Sekti Blinken, uh, Trudeau made a statement in uh, Ottawa that uh, he had asked the U.S. Secretary of State to raise this matter with mm -hmm. India. So it's not as if he's letting go. The fact that he wanted to tell the Canadian press that he was following through and that he had asked the U.S. Secretary of State to raise this matter means that uh, he... Uh, intends to go through with this because he's in a very difficult situation, which he has created for himself. Having said that in Parliament formally, he is now to prove and substantiate his allegations. Since uh, these are based on intelligence sources, and these intelligence uh, uh, sources are external to Canada, it's, it's the United States, uh, obviously, that has provided some intelligence, uh, he has to have the permission of the US to make such intelligence public, or even to share it with us. And secondly, the nature of the elegance, uh, intelligence is such that uh, you can give di different interpretations to what you may have heard. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is never uh, treated as evidence. It has to be turned into evidence. It has to be corroborated. And there are different levels of intelligence uh, in our own system, I'm aware, uh, at least at the time when I was in office, we grade the intelligence based on how reliable it is, how reliable uh, the source is, uh, and uh, how much conclusions you can reach uh, from the intelligence that you gather. Now, I read in the social media that uh, you know the United States intercepted some uh, communications between our diplomats. First of all, again, from my experience, I can say very categorically that no Indian diplomat will talk loosely like this uh, on telephone or, it, or in other forms of communication between each other. Uh, first of all, diplomats not involved in this kind of a thing. If it is done, it's done by the intelligence agencies. And, uh, and, and they know that they are being 
uh, monitor their surveillance they're being listened into and as we know from experience of uh, uh, islamist groups and everything else uh, the kind of channels they use for communicating uh, things uh, which uh, uh, are in code words uh, you have to over a long period uh, monitor these communications and understand what those code words are uh, because if they are repeated, they know that this word actually means something else. Uh, but here in this case, it's quite clear that uh, before the event occurred, uh, Trudeau had no intelligence because it's only after three months or so that he came out with this, which means that uh, whoever provided this intelligence, it was a post facto affair, uh, which means that uh, there was no uh, time to monitor this over a long period to understand what these communications are. Anyway, these are technical matters. The long yeah. and short is that uh, if he had, he, he knew this was intelligence or information, right or wrong, he knew he could not share it, then why did he go to the floor of the house and say that uh, uh, we have uh, intelligence to the effect that uh, the the, uh, we have credible allegations that uh, the Nijas death is potentially linked to the agents of the government of India. Uh, now, he's done that, obviously, for local political reasons, and we know what they are. He, he has a minority government in the last yeah. elections of 2021. He couldn't win a majority of seats. Uh, and he's a man who's very much, uh, how should I say, avid for retaining power. Uh, and his father was prime minister and uh, he became prime minister at a very young age. He's not going to let go of power. And he's dependent on Meet Singh, uh, the NDP leader who has 25 seats in parliament. And Jagdeep, Jagdeep Singh himself is, high, is, I think, not wrongly suspected of Khalistani links. Uh, he is, in, if you like, the political face, the power face of the a Sikh community, not necessarily the Khalistani, but the Sikh community in, in, the, in the Canadian parliament. And there are about 700,000 uh, Sikhs in about 15 constituencies. Their vote is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, so if these Khalistanis amongst these larger Sikh community and they are militant, they are aggressive and they have money power and they have been uh, funding the, the, the party, if they then, through Jagmeet Singh, um, you know, channel their grievances, uh, they want to get satisfaction. They want the government and Trudeau uh, to pinpoint, uh, or to point fingers at India. And here, it is interesting how the son of, uh, of uh, Nijar to the press, now this is not here, he has said that, that he was a regular touch with the Canadian intelligence, CSIS, since February, meeting them, meeting them once or twice a week. In fact, he had a rendezvous with them two days after he, you know, he was killed. What, what does this mean? Was he an agent of the uh, Canadian intelligence? Was it that through him, the Canadian intelligence was keeping tab on other groups? Because a lot of crime, organized crime, human trafficking, drug tra trafficking, and everything else. So there are wheels within wheels in this intelligence uh, business. Right. So that is the reason why this issue uh, has come uh, to uh, to the internet, to international attention because of the folly of this very immature uh, juvenile politician called Justin Trudeau, who is not grown up, who has not learned any lessons from his 2018 trip uh, to India, which was a disaster, uh, and who doesn't seem to appreciate the importance of relationship with India and the new ge new geopolitical uh, context, knowing fully well that the other countries in the Five Eyes, leave aside New Zealand, uh, have huge stakes in India, huge stakes in India, whether it is United States or Britain or Australia. And then if he raises a matter like this internationally, uh, there's bound to be um, repercussions in terms of uh, managing ties between these six countries and India, because they also can't, what I mean is the three countries that <clears throat> or the five I countries, they also can't let go this, let go of this 
casually saying it's all right, it has happened. They can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their own political position is at stake internationally and uh, domestically. And the importance here is that uh, Canada is such a dutiful and loyal ally of the uh, United States. They have sacrificed so much in every war that the United States has fought, they, including the Second World War. The Canadians have yeah. been there. And therefore, they can't easily snub Canada or abandon Canada. And hence, to my mind, rather unfortunately, but this is this was logical in terms of the situation that Fan Trudeau created, that both mm -hmm. uh, the Jack Sullivan, uh, the national security advisor, uh, started talking down at us that India must uh, cooperate, that no yeah. country has special exemption, and that there has to be uh, accountability, and that we have certain principles uh, which we must adhere to. And Blinken added to that that we are not only consulting with Canada, but we are coordinating with Canada, <laughs> and that uh, and there should be accountability and, and stuff like that. Uh, so they have, in a sense, created a problem in relations between the United States and India uh, without realizing uh, the geopolitical consequences of its folly. Mm -hmm. Tell me, you mentioned that uh, this intelligence was given to the Canadians, perhaps by the Americans, perhaps by somebody else. Um, what does that tell you about uh, um, our relations with those countries, you know, that uh, see us as strategic partners yet um, apparently have no issue with um, uh, also poking some holes in that relationship. Well, you know, the others are allies, close allies, and they have fought together. They have yeah. military bases, uh, the United States have military bases in, in the UK as well as in Australia. They have, they have engaged in very important uh, defense programs. In fact, the British uh, nuclear submarine fleet uh, is entirely uh, American in the sense the technology is all American. And now they are building this uh, new nuclear propelled submarines in Canada. This AUKUS business has been formed, which all the three countries have come together. And uh, and then, of course, beyond, beyond this, there is this uh, thing about uh, G7, uh, the Western hegemony uh, over global affairs since 1945 how that is being pushed back but they then have to push push it push back on their own side to make sure <laughs> that power shifts are not such that their own prosperity and future uh, is, is jeopardized and in this who will play a vital role not india we are talking about multipolarity we're talking we are members of sco we're members of uh, BRICS. we want to be leaders of the global south we are not allies of the united states we may be strategic partners because we have certain common uh, challenges. The uh, United States has developed uh, uh, vital interests in India, not only with regard to China, but the growth of India, the size of our market, to make sure that India remains aligned to the Western bloc, even if it's not a member of the Western bloc. Because having ruptured the relations with <laughs> Russia and China, if India also walks out of the orbit of the West, then look at the geopolitical situation. Then it's real multipolarity on the ground, real multipolarity and all the other consequences, de-dollarization of the global economy and everything else. Uh, Is there also a sense uh, that after G20 and all that and um, what came out of there, that there's a need to bring India down a peg or two? I think so. Um, I think so. Um, the, see, the point is that... Uh, in, in all these uh, relationships, uh, there is no altruism. There, yeah, there are hard heavy decisions. You look at the positive, you look at the negatives, you see where you can profit most and where you can cut your uh, future uh, losses, if you like, in some ways. Now, if India already has been very difficult to manage, even when we mm. were weak, even during the Cold War, and as we go stronger, we'll, be, we'll become more difficult uh, to manage. And as we uh, develop our own technologies, our own military strength, and all this self-reliance business actually begins to take shape, that we are no longer reliant on externally on food, uh, but we now have this renewable energy and all the, you know, uh, global solar reliance and water biofuels reliance and all that. In the sense, in the energy sector, uh, we are also trying to find ways and means to develop some 
autonomy, some autonomy. We'll never be able to get full autonomy, but we are trying to do that. And in the digital sphere, we are now actually more advanced in some basis, especially in terms of uh, unified payment systems and other and uh, digital uh, uh, transactions. Uh, and that is why in the G20, uh, there was a lot of focus by us on the digital uh, infrastructure. Uh, 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 what does that mean, actually? Because in this area, uh, in the DPI, digital public infrastructure, uh, we are actually challenging <laughs> the big tech companies and developing a, 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 a digital uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, no, an ecosystem we are developing, which actually puts us in the lead and competes with the with the uh, big tech and will be very attractive to the developing countries. So for all these reasons, uh, their intelligence agencies, elements in those societies, uh, but all of them are not friendly. Now here, for example, the media is most unfriendly. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, <laughs> what is the role of the media? Is it to create understanding or misunderstanding? Is it to bring countries together or pull them apart? And, and the Western media is doing everything possible to make it difficult yeah. for the governments of these countries to come closer to India because they keep raising all kinds of issues. They demonize the present government. Uh, human rights violations, minorities are being persecuted. Every single incident, one death somewhere in one corner of India is projected as the handiwork of Prime Minister Modi and things like that. Uh, so, so there are these, uh, in, in the academic world, it, it's the same thing. In the think tanks, it's, it's the same thing. So no government can be totally impervious uh, to public opinion in their own country yeah. circles, which actually have influence on official policy. So, therefore, uh, these people will shape an agenda and shape a narrative uh, which would uh, require for the governments to have some, some leverage over India. And India has a lot of false lines, social and others. We have certain Absolutely, weaknesses. Yeah. So they want to use those, keep those handy in order to be able to let India understand that, you know, it is vulnerable. So it's part of that uh, game that is going on. Mm -hmm. Another point, in many of these countries, there are those little ginger groups, you know, Khalistanis, of course, in Canada. Then you have Islamic groups in UK. You also have Khalistanis in Australia. Um, all these various groups have been there for many years. And um, I mean, what does, what does that leverage give to these uh, countries? Is it deliberate to try and keep... Um, some of these groups here that are known to be anti-Indian. Oh, yes, with, of um, you know? yes, of course. Definitely. Definitely. No doubt about it. Uh, because um, uh, they know very well uh, the background, the history of violence in Punjab. Yeah. They know what happened in uh, <clears throat> the 1980s. Uh, the Binrewala uh, movement, uh, terrorism in Punjab. Uh, the communal uh, killings in Punjab, uh, the storming of the Golden Temple, uh, the consequences of that, the uh, 1984 riots, anti-Sikh riots in uh, Delhi. And of course, this movement was uh, eliminated uh, in Punjab through very strong means, there's no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Punjab recovered. Uh, became stable and became peaceful. But there has been a backlash uh, amongst the Sikh community because of these events. And then and then you have these uh, Khalistani elements uh, or other the Sikh diaspora, which is very large in number in, 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 in these countries. And amongst them, you have the people uh, who no state who have no stake in India in the sense that they're they're not citizens of India. They have no future in India. They may have interest in India, but they have no future in India. And they are safe and secure in a foreign country. So they are developing an agenda. And this has other useful purposes. Uh, one of course is that uh, uh, by being by being extremists and uh, activists and whatever else, they want to control the Gurdwara. Mm -hmm. And Gurdwara, as you know, in the Sikh tradition, 
<laughs> they receive a lot of money. A lot yeah. of money. Uh, in fact, that is what SGPC politics is. <laughs> they receive <laughs> a lot of money at their command. And this money they can use uh, for financing political parties uh, and for other uh, purposes. And then they have got involved in uh, in drug trafficking, human trafficking, organized crime, violence, and, and, and everything else. So it's a power play. They want to control uh, the the Sikh community and be the be recognized as the as the leaders. In addition to what they think are the grievances of the Sikh community, and behind that, and then there's another reason that if they keep this thing sort of alive and this narrative of Sikhs being persecuted and human rights violations, this and that, then they can get more and more people coming in as refugees and asylum seekers and everything else. So that also uh, helps them. And so far as the, these countries are concerned, since the Khalistanis don't target them, there is no local yeah. terrorism. Uh, so they don't take it seriously, unlike Islamic terrorism, which targets them. Mm -hmm. So here, they say, and then of course the feeling is, you know, this is sort of an Indian affair uh, yeah. between the Sikhs in, in these countries and uh, the government of India or Sikhs in Punjab is not really related. Uh, to us. So they take a very lackadaisical, <laughs> permissive view of, of everything. But in the case of Canada, this is utterly shameful. So they should recall what happened in 1985, the yeah. downing of Air India plane, uh, 329, uh, mostly Canadian citizens killed. But again, since they were Canadian Sikhs, uh, largely or mostly, uh, I think I suppose they feel that they were not white Canadians. So it, it doesn't matter. That's why there was no proper inquiry. Yeah. No mm. proper inquiry. It took them 20 years uh, to do some inquiry. Uh, and ultimately, they they uh, jailed only one person, this Rayat fellow. Yeah. <laughs> Does this politics, uh, but, the Gurdwara politics you mentioned, is it also playing out in Australia? Just to complete this, and I'll answer this question. Yeah. In, yeah. Britain, in Britain, it's the same thing. And in Britain, it is even... Uh, even in a sense, uh, it is uh, the political uh, view of the Sikh community is colored by the historical experience of the British, uh, of the Sikh community, the martial race. Yeah. Uh, they are largely dominated uh, from the Indian side, the Indian army. They served British interests very well. They fought uh, for Britain in the First World War and the uh, Second World War. And Britain uh, was instrumental in uh, creating a communal divide between Hindus and Sikhs, separating them by telling the Sikhs you are not Hindus and set up this SGPC and everything else, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so they feel that uh, they owe to the Sikhs. The Sikhs have been loyal to them. Uh, and, and then, of course, there are these uh, you know, people with imperialist nostalgia in Britain and if India becomes a bigger economy than Britain, I don't think it pleases everybody. Uh, though, of course, the picture is mixed because they have an Indian origin prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> but they want to keep this uh, handle, uh, their agencies, against India if and when uh, it is uh, necessary uh, to uh, put some pressure on India, which is why they reject our efforts to prevent them from having these demonstrations. They continue to have them against our mission. The only concession they have made is that instead of allowing the demonstrators to come actually on the pavement on which the mission is located, they, they now ask them to do these demonstrations across the road on the pavement on the other side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Anyway. Uh, are, we also, are we also a little guilty of um, overhyping this? Such uh, demonstrations, attacks? No, 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 no. no. No, we have suffered. Punjab has suffered. We've seen how a small minority can devastate the state. Yeah. And uh, the Punjab is a border state. Pakistan is very active. Even now, you've seen how they're sending drones with arms and drugs and everything else. And they have, and they actually are giving shelter to, you know, I forget the name. There's so many of these extremist Sikh organizations, Babar Khalsa, whatever it is. Yeah. Their leaders are in, in, in Pakistan. So the Pakistan uh, angle in all this is well known uh, to us and to the and to these countries, the five I countries. They know this. 
And they know that in the demonstrations in the UK, uh, there is an ISI hand. But uh, they, they allow this because it, it suits their interests. It suits their interests. They, they are uh, they have become very permissive also. Uh, and they talk about uh, freedom of speech and right to peaceful protests and this and that. And then they see that there is no retaliation by the Indian side. Now, if we had demonstrations like this against the British High Commission, uh, or if some US consulate was also like in San Francisco, something happened, then they'll wake up. But on our side, we are a law-abiding country, which uh, assume our responsibilities uh, with regard to the Vienna Convention, security of diplomatic uh, premises. We've done nothing against the Canadian High Commission uh, because it's not government policy, and rightly so. But th they know that there is no retaliation. Uh, so they can they can disregard our representations. So what you're saying is that if tomorrow there was a demonstration perhaps against the Canadian High Commission or an attempt to storm it, um, matters would begin changing over there. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. I won't recommend that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, if the public got so wrought up and uh, they did this, and uh, like in the case of... Uh, uh, our consulate in Vancouver or somewhere else. It was firebombed or something or smoke bomb. And if something like that happened, uh, they'll have to sit up and, and say this can't go on. They'll make representations to us, won't they? And then True. won't we come back and say that, look, what are you doing on your side? There has to be reciprocity. We assume our obligations, but you please assume your obligations too. Uh, so it is cost free uh, to them uh, relatively, uh, and which is why they're not serious about uh, addressing it. But now, after what had happened, despite uh, the rhetoric of <laughs> this juvenile prime minister, uh, not only they, but the other countries would have to take our concerns seriously. They know that India is refusing to be bullied. We have reacted very strongly. We have talked about Canada as a safe haven of terrorists and organized crime and tra drug trafficking. We have used a language which we normally reserve for Pakistan. And here's a G7 Western country which talks of itself as a democracy and or human rights and all that stuff. And we're treating it as a semi terror state. Now, this message uh, it will be absorbed by, uh, by other countries that uh, they have to address India, India's concerns seriously. What would it take for all these kind of activities in those countries to stop? What would it take? What would India have to do? Grow bigger? Well, uh, yes and no. You know, we continue to be attacked. Look at China. They've grown bigger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The <yeah>. largest <laughs> economy in the world, the biggest exporter in the world, control all kinds of critical raw materials. They can uh, lead over the West in, in certain critical areas, uh, uh, communication technology. Uh, electrical vehicles and this and that. Yet the attacks on China uh, on go on. Now, of course, the, to my mind, in some senses, that is legitimate. Why? First of all, Chinese system. Yeah. Totally big. We don't know how they take decisions. Secondly, their aggressiveness. Uh, their, uh, the manner in which they have uh, in, <clears throat> taken control of uh, uh, islands and rocks in the South China Sea. The physical aggrandizement in terms of yes. uh, uh, um, claims, sovereignty claims. Look at and with India, what they have done, broken all agreements, and we don't know why. Yes. And they, are not in, they don't intend to go back. Uh, so China's, uh, uh, and then China, through its BRI project, is very clear in its mind what its goals and ambitions are. Uh, to be at the center stage of global uh, governance by 2049 uh, or 2049. Uh, and uh, they, so they made uh, their ambitions, geopolitical ambitions, clear to counter the United States and become a countervailing power. In other words, establish a G2 kind of a thing. Now, we are not challenging uh, the, the United States. Uh, yeah. Or, or, or the G7. <laughs> we want to work with them. We want to work with them. We are a democratic country. We are not uh, making territory grabs anywhere else. 
We only want to protect the territory we have. So we are not challenging. We want the global. We are not challenging the global system in terms of wrecking it. We are only challenging it in terms of making it more democratic and equitable. Yeah. Where the West continues to be uh, to to play its uh, role, but others should also have a say and also yeah. play their role. So that is a better balance. That's all we want. So in in that background, uh, I think there's a big distinction between India and China. But but at the end of the day, uh, the Anglosphere and the uh, and these countries which have dominated the growth for so long, they're not easily going to give up their hegemony yeah. and their power within the system. And they look at any challenge, even if it is democratic, as a yeah. challenge where they will not want to confront India uh, beyond a certain point, but also have some leverages vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis India, which, which, which then uh, tells the Indian decision makers that uh, beyond a certain point, they also can't go to challenge the West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the state of the world order. And I suppose as India grows, that uh, the insecurities on that side may even deepen. Um, no actually, hard solutions I've there. Never, I've never accepted the term global order. It's always been a global disorder. But yeah. the degrees of disorder uh, has varied. Yeah. Now, look at our own example. When, first of all, leave aside the colonial era and the whole decolonization. Uh, uh, process. Uh, we, as a democratic country, which we were right from the start, we are the most sanctioned democratic country in the world, Absolutely. and by whom? Yeah. By the United <laughs> States of America. Uh, yeah. 2005. Uh, so uh, then they, before that, supported Pakistan, armed Pakistan. They let China. Uh, Pass on nuclear technology. I don't think it was only a China affair. It was also the hand of the West, and I won't mention countries. And then, of course, interfering in the Kashmir issue, trying yeah. to mediate, uh, making it difficult for us uh, in so many ways. And on the human rights issue, targeting us, which they still continue uh, continue to do. Uh, this narrative that the West has developed uh, against India. Uh, from our point of view, is this a global order, or is a it's a global disorder? Yeah. Uh, from our point of view, and from the point of view of developing countries in general. Now, look at the Ukraine conflict. If you are talking of the global order, uh, now we have nothing to do with the Ukraine conflict, and the developing yeah. countries have nothing to do with it. It's a purely a European conflict, which is anchored in the whole issue of the failure of Europe to develop. A European security architecture. Yeah. The only answer has been expansion of NATO, expansion of EU, and that has led them to what the situation is today. <laughs> yeah. And in Ukraine, both these things, expansion of EU and expansion of NATO, have, have become the casus belli, if you like. But the consequence of that disruption of energy supplies, disruption of food supplies, fertilizer supplies, and everything else, all of us are suffering. In what way this is consistent with the uh, rules-based order or global-based order? It is another form of global disorder. Anyway, mm -hmm. this is what my So whether India is a partner or an ally or whatever, the uh, West will continue to test and tease us uh, as we go forward. Ambassador, yes. uh, Sibu, pleasure talking yeah. to you. Thank you up very much for that perspective. Up to a point. Up to a point. Up to, <laughs> yeah, a, up point. to a point. Thank yes. you very much, sir. My pleasure. Bye-bye. And for those of you who joined us on this conversation, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media. Thank you very much. Good night.